Hello and a warm welcome to this special program, 70 Years of Freedom. I'm Neelu Vyas. As the country enters into the seventh decade of its birth and survival, there have been many giant leaps which have been taken in terms of development and other social indicators. But there are many challenges which still remain. What's the journey ahead and what has been the journey so far in the last 70 years and also dissecting it in the present context. Joining me now is a scintillating panel of guests. Next to me is Mridula Mukherjee, the eminent historian and author. Next to him is a man who doesn't need any introduction, Mani Shankar Iyer, veteran Congress leader, author, a former diplomat. And next to him is P. Murli Dhar Rao. He's again the General Secretary of BJP, a man who's also of an RSS background. Welcome all of you on this special program. And not to forget, yes, you must have heard the claps already. Apart from the guests, we have a scintillating and a bright set of students from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Amity University, APJ University, and Manav Rachna International University. So all of them are here, and they are going to have an interactive session with this bright set of panel, which is here. And they will be free to ask questions. The panelists will pose them questions. My first question to you, Mr. Manishankar Iyer, I would like to start from you, is that if freedom is really responsibility, how far have you really gone ahead without getting into any kind of political rhetoric? I would just like to know an individual viewpoint that how responsible really have we been in terms of freedom? Considerably. Okay. Yes, there are gaps, but I think we should begin on a positive note. Okay. Because after all, at the time we became independent, it was widely predicted that there would be the balkanization of India and that we would collapse. Churchill said that the country was being handed over to men of straw. And given the trauma of partition, it did seem uncertain as to whether we would be able to survive, to use the word you used right. in your introduction. Right. We've not only really survived, we've flourished. And I think if we understand the basic reasons for this, without going into the politics of it, <laughs> uh, we would have to begin by understanding the concept of our nation being based on unity in diversity. Right. And diversity includes diversity of opinion. Okay. And until 1947, the Congress was a movement. And within that movement, it held a diversity of opinion. In 1947, it started converting itself into a political party. Okay. And uh, when it did, it opened the doors for other political parties Enjoyed to it. express their opinion. Up, but by I then we had a parliament, <laughs> right. well, to begin with a constituent assembly and later a parliament, within which these contending schools of thought could intellectually combat each other right. and determine the destiny In of fact, the nation. I'm going to take a cue from what Mr. Ayer said that freedom so far has been about the celebration of unity and diversity, as he said. Uh, Mr. Purli Dhar Rao, you have to answer a lot on behalf of the on behalf of the government as well as RSS, in terms of uh, unity and diversity, do you really think that the nation has been responsible? In my view, in the last seven decades, there has been a consensus. Okay. Uh, cutting across... But when uh, you say consensus, it's consensus on what all grounds? What, what is the benchmark you I'm, really look I mean, at? I'm coming to the point. There has <laughs> been a consensus. Consensus is uh, the unity of the country. Okay. Whenever the unity of the country has been challenged by outside force or sometimes by inside forces, there has been a political consensus and there has been always a national consensus about the unity of the country. And also, unity with the diversity. What it has been said now, a country linguistically diverse, religiously diverse, and socially it's a diverse society <coughs> so all diversities we have now added to that the political diversity we have so even after all this diversity diversity is cherished diversity is nurtured and accepted so with all these things we have been able to prove that as a diverse country we can preserve and maintain the unity and we can also nurture the diversity yeah. 
and the, uh, uh, the neighboring countries have not been able to do. In fact, uh, President Obama has also quoted on the diversity and unity of, of a country like India. Uh, Mithilaji, I would like to bring in you here that when we are talking about the unity and diversity, according to your opinion, has it just been in the form of narratives? Has it just been in the form of a political rhetoric? Has it just been there for the sake of being there? Uh, how would you see, how would you look at the last 70 years? No, I think that, as Vanishankar Ayoji said, that there have been considerable achievements, okay. which doesn't mean that there haven't been failures. Right. And I'd like to again reiterate that fact that despite uh, the trauma of partition, which affected millions in this country, we were able to establish a secular constitution. We were able to hold general elections based on adult franchise within right. a matter of uh, three years. And then we were able to uh, internalize uh, in the minds of people the values of democracy, diversity, pluralism, secularism, I think in a very substantial way. Right. I would say this story carries on till about the 70s and the 80s. Okay. And there, is, there was a consensus, but I think fissures in this consensus begin to appear from about the 80s and I think the Babri Masjid uh, incident was okay. a big break in this consensus. So you because would call for it the as one time, Because for the first time in a substantial way mm -hmm. after independence there was popular mobilization not just one incident in happening somewhere on a local issue, a riot happening and then everybody saying this is wrong and uh, trying to solve the matter but a mobilization, a consistent planned mobilization to actually bring about polarization in Indian society, right. which violated the consensus on the unity in diversity. But so I think fissures began to appear and I'm sorry and to say that becoming, the story right. since then has not been the story of achievement which we saw, okay. almost linear. But, but a uh, different story I, which, yeah. which we need to take on board. But Mr. Ayer, the fissures at which Mridula Ji is pointing out, what do you think has been the basic reason of these fissures? Of course, Babri Masjid has been one uh, incident which, which highly mobilized the people, divided the society on communal lines. But apart from that, that, there have been governments who have ruled the country. Why were they not able to control? Was it that the ruling government couldn't have a consensus with the opposition? Or was it the opposition which was trying in, in a bit to come back to power, didn't, contain, didn't try and contain uh, incidents like this? What was the real reason? There are two basic philosophies uh, informing the concept of our nationhood. Okay. It was Jawaharlal Nehru who used the expression, the idea of India. Okay. And so in a sense, the Nehruvian camp has appropriated that phrase and said that the idea of India is more fundamentally based on secularism than on any other single concept. Okay. But that you cannot have a secular country without a democratic country and without a country that looks after those who are oppressed and which maintains the independence of the nation. There was an alternative narrative that goes back to the early 20s when uh, Vinod Damodkar, uh, Vinay Damodkar, uh, Savarkar uh, uh, brought out an alternative philosophy which he called Hindutva in which he basically argued that only those who regard this land as their Pitrabhumi, their fatherland, and as their Punyabhumi, the land from which their faith derives, can be proper Indians, and by definition they had to be Hindus. Right. And he propagated an alternative vision of our nationhood. I think Murlidhar Rao is right in saying that where there was a sharp divide between the Savarkar view of India and the Gandhi Nehru view of India, the fact that we brought in a constitution, ran a democracy, in, no, no, not didn't try to balance it. It gave the opportunity for those who espoused the alternative idea of okay, India okay. to enter our political system. Right. They've had a rough ride because for the first 40 years, they were really irrelevant to the political process. But since the 1990s, they have increasingly come into this space. And it's resulted in a divide even within the Hindutva movement, where there are the politicians who feel they must adjust to the ground reality as well as the constitutional compulsions. 
and therefore become rather more secular than uh, was expressed in the Hindu philosophy. And there are others who say that notwithstanding the, ad ad the adaptation that has taken place, the battle is still on for the soul of India because if you emphasize the majoritarianism of Hinduism in a country which is 85 percent, the others will feel that they are being marginalized. So the battle continues, but thank God it has been brought within the framework of the democratic institutions which was set up at the start of our independence. But uh, Mr. Murlita Rao, this uh, Savarkar view of the nation and the Nehruvian view of the nation, what uh, Mr. Ayer is talking about, uh, he spoke of a certain Hindu Rashtra at that time. Uh, certain years, in fact, certain decades have passed and still we are talking about a concept like Hindu Rashtra. Uh, my question to you is, that has the nation really matured? Because when a human being is maturing, and a 70-year-old man is said to be a mature man, but we as a nation are still saying that we are not a mature democracy, we are not a mature nation. Uh, what do you think is the basic reason for this? No, I don't agree that uh, India has not matured or uh, like a 70-year-old man. India is a country of the young people. At the same time, India has also but demonstrated... Of no, no offence meant to yeah, the people a, in the 70s. A, India has also <laughs> many times demonstrated its maturity uh, compared to any other even western countries where uh, democracy is practiced uh, when democracy itself was uh, threatened the people of this country and the political spectrum cutting across all ideologies they have uh, valued democracy as an inalienable thing and which we have to keep it so for that people have fought and now everybody accepts democracy is a very important thing and it has become successful. So okay. first point. Second important thing we would like to say is Hindutva, whatever, you know, people have uh, different perspectives and different interpretations. How you interpret The biggest is, uh, interpretation which comes yeah, in that probably divides the, the society. I agree the interpretation given or accepted by the Supreme Court okay. as a way of life and the secularism which we talk about. The secularism... I don't see that it has uh, come from only Nehru. Even Nehru has uh, absorbed the uh, essence of this soil and he, that is the reason he has uh, uh, articulated the secularism in such a way. So in this country secularism is successful, not because of uh, some imitation uh, we, uh, of the western why country. Why do we see that the word secularism is suddenly becoming a flashpoint between political parties like Congress and BJP? What is the reason? I'll ask Mr. Iyer also, but first you answer. No, but uh, here uh, we what is the main day, reason for day, that? Day to day politics and the political mobilization. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is interpreted in such a way to suit the interests of uh, th this following and that following, but I would like to say here the, no, for example, when, when you Mr. have Mohan a democracy, Margot, when yes? you have a democracy, when you have a political, uh, you know, ideas clashing and uh, the identity issues are also emerging, sometimes uh, the identity issue around which some mobilization has taken place, it is treated as a threat to secularism, but I don't think it has never been and it will be uh, never, uh, it will ever it will be like but that. Mr. Ayer, why do you think that this word secularism is suddenly becoming a flashpoint? Because the other side usually pronounces it as secularism. Okay. Is it a sickness okay. or is it the heart and soul of our country? I didn't for a moment suggest... Secularism, you're spelling it as S-I-C-K, right? That's the way in which I'm... it sometimes gets pronounced. Okay. Why is this word there? It's not because we're imitating anybody. It's because there is no easy, ready equivalent. We thought in the Constitution that we could use the word dharma nirpekshta. Right. But uh, Murli, there's a lot objected and they said ki dharm ke prati aap kaise nirpeksh ho sakte ho. Mm -hmm. So they've invented a word called panth nirpeksh So obviously the expression in contemporary India, independent India has its own particular connotation. So basically both the and parties, Mridhala ji. No, no, one second, one second. This is very important. Right. So okay, I'll, okay, go ahead. I request you to not interrupt okay. here. To understand, it's not Nehru, it's not even Gandhi, it is India. Over 5,000 years, we have demonstrated an ability to live with heterogeneity that no one else in the world has done. And it is therefore a reflection of India's civilizational greatness 
to attribute this to all the different diversities that have flown into our country from every major religion of the world, including those that were born here, and not to attribute it only to the Sanatana Dharma. And that makes for a big divide. I call it a rift valley. And until that rift valley is bridged, the challenge between the two ideas of India will continue. These are two different ideologies which which are being spoken about. Mr. Ayer is talking about a particular ideology. Mr. Murli Radha Rao is talking about a particular ideology. Why do you think that these ideologies, it is very difficult for the political class to accommodate these two kind of ideologies? There is a certain intolerance which has been spoken of at large in the past few months, especially in the last two years, the political intolerance, the ideological intolerance. What do you think is the basic reason? Why is the political class getting so unaccommodative? No, I think there are two different issues. Okay. It's one thing to say you accommodate an opposite point of view, which means you compromise with it. Okay. You take something from it and put, uh, you know, make it part of your own. That okay. is not necessary. Mm -hmm. I have every right to hold to my very firm, strict, pure view, if I like, of mm -hmm. secularism or whatever, just as okay. Mr. Mulidhar Rao uh, has. Okay. We can argue, we can debate, and we can hope we can influence each other. Okay. But at the end of the day, if we can't, I think what's most important, and this is what our constitution guarantees to us, and our tradition guarantees to us, and our freedom struggle has guaranteed to us, is the freedom to continue to believe and have the freedom to continue to express fact, what I'll you take believe. A cue from no, and that's no, excuse right. me, I want to finish this. This is where the crux is coming today. The, the Congress party and other similar parties which held power more or less for the first 50 years uh, after independence uh, did believe in totally in freedom of expression and freedom of civil liberties, freedom of press, freedom of association and all that. The BJP says it believes in them. But, but the fact practice. of the matter is that the assaults that we are seeing today on freedom of expression. I come from a university which has been badgered in the last six months for some students expressing some points of view which have been arbitrarily declared without proper investigation or this thing to be anti-national and then you are picked up and you are uh, made into scapegoats and you are called anti-national. In fact, I'll come no, to I, want to, right. I want to just elaborate upon this further. And this is not just a question of JNU. This is happening everywhere, whether it's the Dalit issue, whether it's the issue of the Muslims, whether it's the issue of cow uh, uh, fact, slaughter I was, I was... and all that. I think what is happening is the freedom to some groups of people with the aid and backing of state power to impose their version of how people should live their lives on others and get away with it. But this is actually assaults on our freedom, which has been guaranteed to us by our but constitution. Mr. Rao, the way we have seen the things, I'm talking about the Dalit issue, the Dalit atrocities which have been on the rise, then there has been a certain uh, uh, scaremongering which has been, I mean, uh, the, the, the intelligentsia, the liberal intelligentsia feels threatened that probably there is, the, there is no space for dissent. There is a certain intolerance and the minister what? in the PMO used the word the other day, intellectual terrorism. What does it mean? Okay, okay. Somebody who talks a different point of view is now called a terrorist. Okay. Only you are saying intellectual terrorist. Why is this? Why is Tomorrow, this? Manishankar and both will be called intellectual terrorists. But Mr. Mulligan, are behind bars right. for being a different kind of Why terrorist. Why do you think that there has been a certain silence on the part of the government? We hear statements coming up here and there, but they are very erratic. Sometimes the prime minister will make a statement. Sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll hear from some quarter of the BJP. But there is not a consensus sensual condemnation of a particular incident, for example, maybe the, 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 the Dalit atrocities which we have seen in UNA. You know, in this, first of all, I don't agree. I would like to say that it's intellectual terrorism or these kind of things. You know, for the last uh, so many years, a certain kind of people who have been uh, uh, working uh, from different institutions and with uh, different positions and with right. different perspectives, you know, now there is a, a, a challenge to the kind of thinking which they used to express. If the if uh, if uh, freedom of expression was never curtailed in the past, if that was so, then what what happened in 1975? What do you call an emergency? So let's let's hear from Mr. Ayer. Uh, let, let's hear Mr. Ayer on this. Uh, Obviously. I condemn the emergence. Absolutely. Okay. So do I. I, I think it was an aberration. 
Yeah. I do not think that was the right solution to the problem at that stage. Okay. And I want to give the credit to the person who imposed this emergency. Okay. Without any outside pressure on her, either from within the country or outside, she decided to withdraw this emergency. So she made a mistake. She recognized it, acknowledged it, and ended it. But my question to you is that if, if, if Congress committed the mistake and yeah. it tried to improve on it, why not BJP? No, no, here, BJP. But, but for, my first question to you, Mr. Rao, but first tell me, does BJP really admit to the fact that this cow politics, Dalit atrocities, are these really mistakes no, on the part of the when, government? When Prime Minister had already spoken on that, mm -hmm. the kind of... Uh, 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 initiatives or whatever the uh, steps from different groups in the name of cow protection, it should not go to that uh, extent and taking the law into hands is extent. not, uh, you know, uh, you know mm -hmm. exposing the ca cause of the cow. It is uh, within the purview of the freedom of expression, I would like to say. So, taking yeah, the, the, taking the law issue. into hands. Prime is, Minister uh, addressed a law and order issue that you really have to rein in the cow and, uh, and, uh, and in the Dalit issue. You, we have to accept the cutting across the political differences and classes. We have to accept the problem of Dalit. It is there in the society. But Mr. And Rao, as a society, we have to solve. This is a social evil. And all political parties, irrespective of uh, the other uh, um, differences, but, we have been working. And BJP question. also does not accept the kind of uh, discrimination which is there uh, among the... I totally agree with what you are saying. And outright condemnation, of course, is the first thing. But even after Prime Minister has condemned uh, this incident, there have been organizations like B, uh, VHP, there have been organizations like uh, the Hindu Mahasabha who have come out and given statements that, you know, we'll, we'll go to all extents to see that, you know, uh, this kind of a thing doesn't happen. In fact, in fact, the, the Gauraksha Dal you know, chief, even, even Mr. Kaushik say, himself you, spoke you about this. saying that I, I, I have a background of RSS. Even RSS has issued a statement, elaborated statement. So, uh, cow protection is different. Propagating the cause of the cow is different. Even the people in Congress will pro propagate the uh, cause of the cow. It doesn't mean that it is a monopoly of BJP or monopoly of some party. So, cow, the issue or uh, the advocacy of the uh, uh, cow protection is uh, part so, of the constitution. It is, so, so, we should not uh, take it into the, that, that zone. In one line, I would and like if to anybody, I, I would like to, if anybody, any organization, if it says that uh, law and order and the issue is the issue which uh, the organizations can take and can handle, definitely we cannot accept uh, uh, as a nation. But so Chief, there should not be any an difference. outside condemnation coming from the BJP, from the Prime Minister and uh, the RSS organization saying something else, do you really find it convincing? Do you really find it credible uh, uh, at the face of it at least? You know, I do hope that it is uh, convincing and credible and genuine. Okay. Uh, why should I doubt my Prime Minister and why should I doubt uh, respectable uh, members of public uh, society like Mr. Murlidhar Rao? I do give them uh, the credit, you know, or the benefit of believing that they say what they mean as I hope they give to me. I think what's important, however, is not what just what we are saying you know, at a particular point in time. Number one, it often comes too late. Number two, it's of what's happening on the ground. There was an expose done in a major channel three or four days ago, yeah. where they showed in one part of the country in graphic detail, how in the name of cow protection, people are extorting lakhs and lakhs of rupees. How would you justify so -called this? So-called cow raksha. You know, how why is the state machinery there is clearly a message that's been sent down the line. It doesn't have to be, uh, listen, Let's the RSS or right. any other yeah. organization yeah. is not yes, going to pass a resolution no, saying, yes, please go no, and beat up people who are, no, are uh, the doing this. Challenges, uh, but it's a, a nation, message we are which you're facing as on the occasion of 70 years of freedom. Dalit issue is the issue on which every political party even the spirit How of the freedom exactly movement, we Muslims have to accept. And uh, we, we, you know, on that, there should not be any difference of opinion. Why there should not be any why disagreement. Why not the same thing on uh, the issue of a clerk and the cow slaughter allegation over there? Why only on Dalit issue it should no, no, be no, no, the, a national asking, consensus? No, no, why on the Muslim asked, issue we should she, be divided? She, she, no, no, I why? Mean, you know, why I, is that a when, social when, issue? When, when I say, In fact, we as a country, when uh, after 70 years, we have been able to preserve both diversity and also the unity. What does it mean? And diversity, when I said, it is a religious diversity, is also important thing. 
So, who can go against that religious diversity? Okay. So, so they, 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 there should not be a kind of convenient So, the convenient difference of opinion is still there. Difference of opinion is still there, but our larger debate on Dalit atrocities, we cannot restrict this entire debate only to Dalit atrocities and secularism because we have to talk about other burning issues like Kashmir, uh, foreign policy, the way it has been dealt over the last 70 years. But we'll take a break and when we come back, we go to these larger questions and also interact with this audience, which is going to take questions from the panelists and it goes, it's going to be two-way. Back in a moment. <laughs> Do you have?